Good morning. Here we are on episode nine of building a game with Seth. Uh, just let me know if you guys can hear me okay, if the music's too loud, etc. Uh, I just want to make sure that the chat is working, so feel free to drop some stuff into the chat so I can get that going. Everything seems fine. Let's see if our chat's working. It sure is. Great. Okay. Had a lot of technical problems with the last uh, last episode, so hopefully, hopefully we can get around that this time. All right, so we've been working on this game now for uh, eight episodes, which is something like six, 16 or 17 hours. Um, so let's just take a look. It's been about five weeks probably since the last stream, so I just want to make sure that we get our bearings for what we need to be working on. All right, so here is our menu screen. Just press space tango. And we can walk around. We get this kind of goofy animation. Um, you may notice that the animation is partially frame-based and partially code-based. So his hands and head move around using uh, sine waves. But his legs actually use different frames. And we can look in the art and see, see how that comes together. So here's the three frames of the body and then the parts that we draw on top. Uh, but one thing uh, with the body or with the animation is that notice if I run to the right, my head kind of bobs in this really aggressive left-right movement. If I run to the left, it's different. So we actually have a bug with the animation here. Um, so I want to make sure that we take that into account. So I'm going to, I've started up a public Trello board that you can follow through a link uh, in the uh, in the st stream summary details, whatever. So uh, X flipped head animations displaying incorrectly. Uh, so we can deal with that a little bit later, and we can click to s to spawn these uh, cursors, which we were maybe going to do some kind of click to move or something like that. Um, so a lot of the stuff in the game right now is kind of foundational stuff to just get things ready to start doing, uh, to start doing combat or progression or whatever. Uh, we last, I think, I don't know if it was last time or two episodes ago, but we got this on-screen joystick in the event that we do, uh, mobile controls. And we also have, uh, controller support. So, so here I will, I'm using a joystick to move it and we've got WSD. So we have three different ways to control uh, the game right now. And we also added these warp pads. You step on that, it'll take you to, they'll take you to the same place really. Um, but that'll be kind of our, our way of going to different worlds eventually once we get there. Uh, so the character has this spin attack move, which I can press Q to engage with. Uh, and that spin attack is currently not really usable with a controller because it goes where your mouse is. Uh, so this is this is one of those uh, sort of cart before the horse things, which was creating a move before we actually know how the game is going to control. And then now we would have to go back and refactor that. Um, that's okay. We'll, we'll just take it as it comes. So our next move for this episode is... Uh, I want to start getting some actual combat. Uh, YT Coolio Man says, what about left click instead of Q? Yeah, so that's a possibility. Um, but I wanted to set it up so that you can actually do multiple different things. And, and there was also the question of whether left clicking would, I don't know, select something or, or whatever. So uh, all these things are, are subject to change. And uh, I'd say most of the things you see in the game are pretty half-formed if even that, uh, in terms of their concept. Um, so a lot of the the design process here is just purely iterative. We're just kind of putting things in and, and seeing how they feel, seeing how they work. And if they if they don't work well, uh, then we'll just change them or remove them or, or turn them into something else. Um, so next up I've got in my, in my Trello, so I have a whole bunch of stuff in the inbox and I'm going to move these into the to-do. Um, so I want to first work on a bomb throw ability, and that's going to 
uh, use E. So we're going to press E. It's going to throw a bomb. Uh, the bomb's going to move in a straight line and explode on the first thing it hits. Um, and then we can attach that to a progression system, or maybe when you level up, you can choose to make your bombs stronger. Uh, so we can do that. We've got a basic enemy. Um, we've got an inventory system that we need. So once we can defeat things, then they will drop items. And uh, we started the inventory system last stream, but um, I think that was a little bit premature. And once we have the ability to pick up items, then we can add some items to pick up. Uh, we got a suggestion last stream to have warp holes where you can deposit your stuff and then they get beamed back to the home base. Then we'll have to figure out what happens when you die. Like, do you drop your stuff or or what? Um, and we could probably do uh, maybe, yeah, this over here. No, some, somewhere around here in this order. Um, and then we'll deal with these bugs as they come. All right, so the way that the flow of things goes through this uh, Trello board is any new ideas we have during the stream, we'll just drop into the inbox and we can just evaluate those uh, for priority later. Uh, the to-do list is our current set of priorities of things that we know we want to do. And the doing pile is what we're currently working on. So we'll take uh, this bomb throw ability and that's what we're working on right now. And uh, I'll go ahead and just archive that. All right, so we're going to start working on this bomb throw ability. Uh, we're going to press E and it's going to throw a bomb in the direction of the cursor. So let's uh, first let's make a visual of the bomb. All right. So this thing doesn't have to be anything particularly fancy, but I do want to make um, I do want to make a sort of multiple state thing for the bomb, where you can see it flashing or, or that you can tell that it's going to explode in some way. I think the bomb should probably be right about the size of his head. And let's do that. I'm just going to copy his head just for reference into this hitbox here. But first, we're going to make a circle. And also, this is uh, Inkscape for those of you who aren't sure what program I'm using. It's a free vector graphics program that's extremely powerful. If you're familiar with something like Adobe Illustrator, it's, it's that same kind of a thing. All right, so that's probably a good size. So I can delete his head. I'll center this. And I think the stroke width that we've been using is two for outer stroke and then one for inner stroke. So uh, that's an important note when you're working with vector graphics um, is since you can export things at any size, then it's very easy to get kind of tangled up and end up with a lot of inconsistencies in your art. Uh, so it's always important to make make sure that you have good rules and practices around line thickness. Um, so in this case, we want a two pixel thickness for the outside, or is it three? This is two, okay. I think this bomb should be... Maybe like a cool purple. Pierre, question about Inkscape. Did you try Affinity Designer? Uh, I haven't tried it. I think Sam was playing around with it. Uh, and he, he had some pretty good things to say. Definitely has a different workflow than Inkscape as far as I understand. Alright, so we have this bomb. I think first we want to get some... Maybe like some shinies on it. Make it feel like it's reflective, you know. Maybe a little little sheen over here. I don't really know how reflections work, so we'll just do our best. Ooh. So something that that um, when we when we commissioned an artist to make the box art for Quadrupus Rampage, he made a hilarious note, which was everything in Quadrupus Rampage is shiny, right? Except something being shiny is typically. Uh, because it has, uh, it's in open air, 
and there's a clear light source. But things are not shiny underwater, which is where Quadrupus Rampage takes place. <laughs> so, uh, whoops. He's like, I'll put the shines in the box art, but just know that this is wrong. Okay, so this bomb we want to do... Uh, what do we want to do here? I want to give it a little bit more depth. So I'm going to dupe this. I'm going to cut this out like that. So what I've just made is this shape. And we can give it a deeper purple. So one thing that, um, that I learned from Sam is when people are first starting in their art, I may have covered this before, but I think it's a, it's a interesting note. When people are first starting with their art, they often think like, I want to make a shadow, so I'm going to make that uh, shadow black. So they go black, and then they kind of reduce the alpha. Um, so that, that does work as a shadow, but importantly, if you want to add a little bit more character to your stuff, then instead of using a black shadow, um, actually use some some uh, color. So you can kind of pull this in and give it a little bit more like, a little bit more saturation. So notice how this still looks like a shadow, but it has a little bit more kind of like personality to it and a little bit more uh, force. And you can even just like start with the original color and then kind of, you know, work your way down. So see the difference there and to make something darker all I gotta do is just re reduce any of the color channels and it'll it'll be a darker version of, of that talk gibberish welcome all right so now we're gonna clone this cut out the middle and that gives us okay gives us some kind of shiny ball object um, I think, so I, basically I want to have something on the interior of this that uh, feels like it's like a flashing light or something. So I can pull this in. Um, we could try a gray maybe, or even like a super dark. Let's see what our options are here. Green is, green and purple is two, that's, that's uh that's an eyesore. Hmm. Now, let's just do something dark, and then this will be our flashy light. So it can go between being darkened and, and being turned on. This would be kind of like um, when you look at a like a TV screen or something, and you notice that when it's off, it's not actually black. It's kind of a grayish. All right, so we do this. So the darker something is normally, then the brighter it gets, the brighter you can tell it is when it... Uh, when it starts to glow, it makes that glow feel a lot bigger. So we're going to go, so to make something glow, a lot of times what people think is like, if I want something to glow, uh, let's say I want it to glow red, you know, then it'll be like red. And then now it's glowing red. Uh, but what you'll notice is, is I'd recommend looking at um, any kind of movie where, where you have special effects. I think Star Wars it's actually a really good reference for this, which is they do um, they do like white interior and then and then a colored exterior. So so this it basically makes it feel super super bright. 
and then it also gives it that sense of color so we can do that and then we can knock that down its opacity a little bit What's up, Triple B? Okay, so what we've done is we've created a white hot center with a blurry colored stroke on the outside. So that gives a sense that it's extremely bright in the middle and then it's kind of gives, still gives it the feeling that it's colored. We could maybe go put a little bit of color inside there, but no. I think that's good. All right, so here's our bomb. No light, light. So I'm going to turn off the bounding box and then we'll export this. You notice how like the width and height are different? That's fine, it doesn't matter. Game Maker will um, Game Maker will automatically clip this on the texture page, so all the ex empty space on the outside won't count for anything. Okay, so we're gonna export this as bomb off. And this one as bomb on. Then we probably also want to turn this into something that we can use uh, as an ability icon. So remember a while back we made this icon for uh, for the, the spin attack. So if we want to see how this would look as an ability icon, then we can just put it in there. I think it actually will just work fine as is. Um, so let's just keep it and we'll, we'll try putting it on the interface and we'll see how that goes. Okay, so now let's add some sprites. Player, create sprite import. Uh, let me find the folder here. Art folder. PNGs, these two. All right, so make sure this thing is centered in the middle with the origin there, which it appears to be. It's a little bit of an optical illusion because I put this slightly offset reflection there. Um, but yep, that's how that'll look. And here's full size. Bomb. All right, now I've kind of forgotten how our interface is set up here, so let's um, let's take a look. We have interface element, uh, ability icon. So what's this? This has hotkey display. Does nothing here. And so this ability icon, I think probably I talked about in the past that this, so you notice like this is completely associated with the dash attack, right? Dash attack cooldown, dash attack max cool. Um, it's specifically drawing the spin attack icon. So even though this object is called ability icon, it's exclusive to the spin attack. So the first thing we want to do is go into the player object um, and create an ability system. Okay, so here we have a little region in the player create event where the abilities are initialized, but notice it's just about the dash attack. Uh, so first I'm gonna create this player abilities uh, enumerator. So it's gonna give a unique ID to every ability. I'll call it spin dash. 
and the bomb throw. Ability cooldowns. Dot spin dash equals uh, zero. Actually, we'll say max max cooldowns is one. And for the bomb, let's do uh, bomb throw. Let's do like a half second. Maybe this will be like your main ability as you chuck bombs at stuff. Okay, and then uh, every ability is going to start with a cooldown of zero, so at least for now. Okay, so here we're going to initialize uh, the, the uh, temporary cooldowns of these things. So ability cooldowns. And then we'll just say I equals zero. All right, so what we did have was a specific dash attack variable. Now we have an array. So the spin dash is part of that, and so is the bomb throw. Uh, so I want to refactor this. So I'm quickly going to control shift to F, find the dash attack cooldown variable, and just make sure that I uh, account for that everywhere in the code before I purge it. All right, so here in the player ability and the player uh, step event, we were only managing the dash attack cooldown. So uh, instead, we're going to say one D uh, ability cooldowns. Okay, so now we're gonna apply this to all the abilities. So we're making this expandable, so we should be able to very easily add a, a third ability later on, and a fourth. My hope is to get four abilities in here. I definitely wanna do a bomb throw. I think maybe a landmine. Uh, we got the spin attack, and then, I'm not quite sure what to do with the fourth one. Maybe some kind of a healing thing. It's always good to be able to heal. Okay, so here we have uh, our dash action, and that's doing that. And then here's dash attack cooldown. So instead we'll say, actually I'm gonna make a script for this because this is gonna be something we're gonna do routinely. Gameplay, abilities. So one, so one feature that GameMaker used to have that I really miss is that it could alphabetize your your folder structure. Can't do that anymore. Instead, you got to do it by hand, or potentially write a script that manipulates the project file and does it for you. Which maybe I should do that. Okay. Uh, hey, Giant Muskrat subscribed. Thank you very much. If I do, please, it'll probably be like a Python script or something. Python is really uh, good for quickly parsing and manipulating these, these kinds of files. All right, so I want to make a ability... Um, ability begin cooldown, and this is script. The script is only to be called within the player, but um, so we'll say ability equals ability max cooldowns. This is a pretty simple script, um, but rather than having to retype this, you know, uh, access to these arrays the whole time, it's just nicer to do it this way. So, ability begin cooldown. Player abilities dot uh, spin dash. 
And then we also have this check on the dash attack cooldown. So um, instead we should have a, a script where we can ask if the ability is available. Like zero, if ability cooldowns the ability. So that's zero. Uh, we can just actually return return this evaluation. And later on, if there are other things that, that come into account for this ability system, like maybe ability has charges or something like that, um, then we can just update this script and we wouldn't have to then go back everywhere in the code. So if ability is available, um, Player abilities dot spin dash and I'm gonna put this into so this is charge attack we'll just we'll do this this is maybe a little bit easier to to read uh, perform charge attack Now I can collapse this region and I can just see, okay, here's what's happening here. Hey, King Jabo. I'm sticking with this project for now. Uh, I was originally considering, I was considering starting a new project that was uh, like a space game that was a little bit lighter on art requirements in terms of how many animations and stuff there needed to be, but um, uh, I think it was Pierre came into the Discord and was saying that a big part of the benefit of watching these streams is seeing how somebody who, who isn't an artist, like myself, uh, uses a lot of workarounds and, and tricks to, to get the, the art even looking decent, even though that's not really the focus. So I'm going to stick with this for a little while longer, and we'll see if the game starts shaping up into something good. And if maybe by the time we get to episode 20, it's not, it's nothing I, I'm interested in, then maybe we'll, we'll change gears. You know, I, I gotta admit, I never played Toe Jam and Earl. I don't really know, I don't know anything about it. All I know is when we launched Quadrupus Rampage, people were like, oh, I see you got inspiration from Toe Jam and Earl. And I was like, I don't, I don't know what that is. <laughs> I think it was probably a, a game from when I was really young. We, we weren't really um, allowed to have... We didn't have gaming consoles when I was growing up. Okay, so uh, so we're manipulating our ability cooldowns here. Uh, let's take a look. Player step. So I think we are just about there. Dash attack cooldown. So all that's left is an ability icon. All right. So this ability should actually have player abilities dot spin dash. So this ability icon object will now have an ability ID. Uh, enumerators are global by default and they get compiled at runtime. Or sorry, get compiled uh, when you compile the game. So they're always available no matter what. So. Uh, we can use this player abilities .spin dash inside of the ability icon object, even though it was initialized in the player object. Okay, uh, so player. So first, here's where we're showing the dash attack stuff. So instead, I'm going to declare the ability ID as a var so that it can be accessed by the player object. Making something a var makes it globally accessible within this block of code by everything. So if I use this with into the player, then the player can still get access to everything. So. Okay, and then we'll say ability cooldown this ability over ability max cooldowns, this ability. And the last thing is this 
icon. Um, so we can, for now, we can actually initialize this in the in the player object if we want to. We may need to break this out into globals somewhere else or something, but player abilities dot bomb throw sp bomb. Interface SP icon. Spin attack. Okay, so we have the ability icons here, and then uh, ability icon object. All right, so actually, this was a bad move. I'm gonna. Go back to the player. I'm going to take these ability things and I'm going to turn them into globals. And the player will keep the ability cooldowns inside. But uh, but this way we can get access to them through the interface and everywhere else. So initialization object, we can say init player abilities. Always use caps for global variables, just so that they're easier to recognize. And now we'll do ability icons. Almost wrote ability coins. And then we can do Control Shift F on ability max cooldowns, and then we can just replace it with the caps version. Boop. So we have that, and I think we are good. Ability icon, ability ID, yep, yep, yep. And then the last thing is this icon here, ability icons. So we've changed everything about this. So presumably, actually first, uh, before I boot this up, I wanna just do a search for ability icon object and see where we are creating it to make sure that it's being done properly. All right, so this ability icon by default has the spin dash uh, as its uh, ability ID. So we should be fine with that. and. If I boot this up, then either it'll crash because I missed something, uh, or it should just look exactly as it did before. Okay, so cooldown still runs. I've just refactored everything so that now it's expandable, but the original code works exactly the same as it did. Um, so now I sh all I should have to do here is, uh, let's see. In the gameplay interface. Here, this is just creating an ability icon. And instead, we're going to say I is less than array. And so we're going to go through all the abilities. And we're just going to create one for each. Okay, so this is not gonna work well because we're spawning both of these in the center. Um, so for now, I'm just gonna, just so we can make sure that they're separated out. Uh, let's see, plus width times I, I think, yeah. So this is gonna, this is gonna sit them next to each other. Okay, so now we have bomb, we have this, notice how we've got a, the same hotkey on both, so that's something that we'll have to figure out. Uh, let's take a look at that. Ability icon. 
hotkey display and hotkey display literally just says Q. That's just hard coded in there. Um, let's see, Q dash is ord Q. All right, so we're going to have to do some work to hook the input system up to the ability system. Dash bomb. So this is what you get when you hard code stuff. Well, Ronan Craig, maybe the second part of that statement betrays the first part. All right, so we're going to do bomb input. We'll call it bomb. It's going to be attached to... So this ORD E means um, that that's the keyboard key we're looking for. And so I think one of the tricky parts about this is... is one of the things that we've done in, in our games is we actually created a, a reverse key mapping so that like, because if for example I said, you know, VK space, and then that's the key binding for bomb, that's the space bar, but the game maker doesn't have a good way to actually display that back as a string. So if I wanted to tell the player, this is space, then I would have to make a system to connect that together. So, I think it's okay as long as we use the letter keys, but once we start getting into the weirder keys, then GameMaker doesn't have a text display for those. So, so we have uh, dash and bomb and player abilities, then we can also say ability hot, uh, hot, hot keys, hooski. All right, so you guys may notice something else here that's problematic, I hope. We'll talk about that in a second. All right, let's call this dash. All right, so we got two things. One is sometimes we call this spin dash, sometimes we call this dash. Maybe we should just call it dash. So everywhere spin dash is, that's just going to now be dash. And here we have bomb throw, but then this is called bomb. It's probably better to just call it bomb. Get those consistencies in there. Bomb throw, bomb throw. Yeah. So the second thing is um, this is going to be a really error prone way to put this together because now it's like dash bomb, dash bomb, dash bomb. Um, so we should instead have a script that allows us to set up the ability. So the ability ID, um, we could even give it a name. And then we have the cooldown. Does the input system display handle consoles? Yes. Uh, it takes quite a bit of work because you need to make visual representation of the, the buttons for consoles. Um, so right now the input system, it does have gamepad buttons. Um, but if you're on a Nintendo Switch, those are different than on a PlayStation, which is different than an Xbox, etc. Um, so that's one of the trickier parts of input management is, is actually creating all the visuals to go along with it. And of course, if you don't have the visuals, then it's really hard to convey to somebody what button they're supposed to push. So, all right, build a cooldown max name. Uh, we've got icon. And then the associated hotkey. All right, we'll call it the input. And 
and uh, instead of making a new variable for every single one of these, we can actually call this ability info. Make a 2D array, and this should make it a little bit easier to manage. I'm actually going to grab these. Name. Max cooldown. Icon. Input. Set up ability. And we'll, we'll just make a new variable called ability info. So later on, I want these abilities to unlock over time as you level up and stuff like that. Um, Giant Muskrat, can you talk about how you estimate time to do tasks? If you don't have more than a one to two hour chunk of time during the week, it gets easy to feel bummed if you had a goal but couldn't meet it in the time you set aside. Um, yeah, I think, unfortunately, the only way to really get a good handle on estimating time for tasks is to have done that kind of thing a lot of times. Because uh, if you can't, if you don't know what's going to go into it, then you, you can't really estimate the time. Um, so that just, that just kind of comes with, with practice. Hmm. <clears throat> Let's see, ability info, we're going to call this, that's just zero, that's just a 2D array. All right, so uh, ability info. The ability info. Twice, just got carried away. You know how it is. Pull down icon and input. Yeah, if you've got one to two hours to work on something, um, I, I think that the trick that people tend to, or the thing that, that people tend to fall into is, is they get a lot of things in their head all at once, and they get kind of overwhelmed with how many things they think are important. And in a small amount of time, you end up bouncing back and forth between lots of different things because you're kind of in a, in a bit of a panic state. Uh, so one of the most important aspects of managing your time is just is prioritizing mixed with focus. And I think something like like Trello helps a lot with that. So if you've just said like, okay, the most important thing for me to be working on right now is this bomb throw ability. You know, I put that in my doing pile and that's the only thing that I should be working on right now. Um, and I don't need to focus on anything else until that's done and then then it's reevaluate the to-do list, pick the next thing, do that until it's done. Because uh, there's other things that you run into where maybe like, if you don't have a concrete plan, then whenever you run into something that's maybe going to take a little bit more time than you expected, you'll have a tendency to ditch that thing and go try to find an, an easier thing. And then you'll ditch that thing and try to find an easier thing. And pretty soon after an hour or two, uh, all you've really done is kind of bounce around between five different tasks and you've hardly made any any progress. King Javo has opt player for the football dudes and they have positions like quarterback or running back. Uh, how you would structure the object when relating to inputs. Putting a button where your QB is different from where you're running back. Mm. Yeah, that's a little bit more involved. We may have to talk about that uh, 
separately in the Discord. That's a that's a you got a pretty complex system. I think the solution won't be that difficult, but it will take a bit to think through everything. All right, ability name, cooldown, icon. Okay, so look here. Here's what we originally had was this. I'm just going to scoot this down so we can keep it there so we can see how bad that was compared to what we're about to do. Is that a player ability? Dot dash. We'll call it dash. Cooldown max, one. Icon. And the input is input dot, oops, input action dot dash, I believe, right? Yeah. Dot bomb, this is a bomb. It's gonna have a half second cooldown icon bomb. All right, it's just bomb. So here's our new thing, and here was our old thing. So notice how anytime I want to add a new ability to this game now, I just do this. And anytime I need to change something about uh, how abilities are, are initialized, I just do it in this one place, and it'll retroactively apply to all of the abilities. Um, so that's super nice. The only problem now is I've got all of these global variables laying around that I have to go back and fix. So I don't think I used this for anything yet, so I'm just going to get rid of that. Ability hotkeys. So we have ability max cooldowns. Okay, so now this instead will say ability info dot uh, what do we got? Max cooldown. Get rid of that, get rid of that. And this is now a 2D array, so. Ability icon is going to be. So we got another interesting note here, which is right now um, the ability icon assumes that the max cooldown is going to be greater than zero, which I think is a fair assumption. But just note that we're we would be dividing by zero here if it was. Okay, and last we have ability icons. Let's get rid of that. Bloop. Also, a game development pro tip, um, hit your delete button really hard. It deletes things better. And shout deleted. Yeah, that's right. You know what I'm talking about. Ability info dot icon. Okay. We've just refactored the ability system twice. So I hope that was useful for you guys. <laughs> it was for me. So, you know. Uh, let's run this and, and see if this actually does what we want it to do or crashes I don't know. okay that worked so the one thing is the whole point of that was to get this dang queue out of here which of course I did not do but now it's possible so now I can I can do that all right so uh, hotkey display is not queue I'll just put a, that and then when we, in the draw event, we can just retrieve that. So, 
hotkey display. This is now going to be a char of see, the ability. I'm going to kind of break this out a little bit so it's a little easier to follow. Dot input. Input info and then input info dot dot what keyboard. All right, so I should call this the keyboard key. So I think sometimes if you've got a lot of nested stuff, it's definitely useful to kind of make little shorthands because like the ability input, it's easier to understand than the ability info, ability ID, ability info dot input, right? The ability keyboard key is now we have the input. So then we get that out of there and then the hotkey display. don't remember if this is actually going to work. So um, what's happening here is in our inputs, we are using this ORD. So I think we can pop that open and see. It takes a single character input string and returns the Unicode value for that character. So that, that turns it into a number. Um, do, do, do. So if we go back to... This, so, so these are all numbers, and then the chr function uh, returns a string containing the character which relates to the input Unicode. So it should flip it back. Uh, but again, that won't work for things like spacebar or tab or whatever. So this is only going to work as long as we're using numbers or letters. But we are, so it should be fine. QE, got it. Now E doesn't do anything at the moment because we aren't actually using that input. Uh, do we have a live stream level head development? No, um, level head, I mean, it's uh, now like a year and a half into dev and it has really, really elaborate systems. So um, I think one of the benefits of live streaming is, is kind of showing how things come together and jumping into a, a game that has, I think the level right now has almost 90,000 lines of code. And at that point, you know, it's just, it's too much. Also, we want to make sure that we obscure a lot of the code that handles a lot of the web functions and things like that. Uh, just so we don't make it easy or so we don't accidentally reveal uh, something about security or, or whatever. So for this game, I don't care. People can see everything. Okay, so we now are displaying the bomb uh, on the interface. Can't use the bomb yet. So I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna commit this. Okay. Uh, do, do. Game dev, stream game. On the master branch here. blow this up a little bit. All right. I'm just going to commit all this. So these are all the things that we changed and we will call this uh, refactored the ability system. So it can be expanded to account for bomb throwing. That. And that's pushed. For those of you who are pulling down the source code from Git, you can pull this down in, in real time. So you can just, you, you have all this now. Uh, GDC talks. So currently the GDC talks that I'm working on are not yet available. Um, they're actually in preparation for GDC this 
spring in March. So, and also one of the criteria of those talks is that it can't be a talk that we've given somewhere else. It should be a new talk for GDC. So unfortunately I have to keep them quiet. Um, but on subject matter, one is about DevOps and one is about forgiveness mechanics in games. Forgiveness mechanics meaning uh, creating systems that, that bias outcomes in, in favor of making the player win more and kind of giving the player a little bit of, a, of an easier time. Okay, so we, we have our ability cooldown. Um, now we want to start throwing bombs. So I'm going to steal this little beginning part of the code. So here we're going to perform a charge attack. Here we're going to throw bombs. Now here's a note. Look what I've done here. Hard-coded dash and player ability dash. How about instead? Mm -hmm. Dot input. Okay, so now I've actually retrieved So now I've actually tied these things together. So whatever the ability, <clears throat> whatever the uh, uh, input is associated with the ability, now it's all connected. Uh, the GDC talks that I'm doing will not be live, or what, what do you mean live? Like in front of a, in front of an audience? Yeah, it'll, it'll be in front of a crowd at GDC, and then. If if the talk is well received, then they'll they'll put it up on their YouTube channel. Um, I did I've given one talk at GDC in the past, and that was about um, our our design approach for Crashlands. Uh, I think that talk was kind of a medium talk. It definitely wasn't one of my best, so it it did not go up on on GDC's uh, YouTube channel. All right, so we're gonna throw bombs. Let's figure out how we are going to throw bombs. So for starters, we need a bomb. Let's go to gameplay, and we're gonna make O bomb. Sprite, guess what sprite? Bomb. And its parent will be a world element. The world element, as you may recall, is the parent object of everything that, live, that exists out in the world. World elements have a width, a height. They know where they are on the grid. Um, they've got a Z, so we can show them having height above the ground. And they've got some other uh, extra little tricks as well. Okay, so this bomb is going to... We'll just inherit the parent event. And then we can do other stuff in the bomb as well. So... We're going to get an X speed and a Y speed. And... Uh, we'll give it a lifetime, so we'll say it'll last for like a second, I guess. We need to determine how fast the bomb will move at a max speed. Um, let's try 600. And if its lifetime is one, that's pixels, uh, or sorry, uh, yeah, pixels per second. If it lasts for one second, then it will travel so far. Uh, another way to do this might be to say like, uh, so we can say like max speed is, is going to be 600 and its max distance would be 600. So we'll just say how far it's going to travel. And then instead, um, we can we can just have its lifetime be, what is that? Max, is it distance over speed or speed over distance? If it was going 1200, then it would need to be distance over speed. All right.
<laughs> a bunch of people hated my talk. Not not a bunch. I, there, there was just a couple um, people who were definitely not happy about it. But I mean, I I think the issue with it was the the talk was called "Designed by Chaos," and it was essentially about it was about like if you guys watch me on stream here, as you can see, like I don't have a plan here. You know, I'm just I'm just doing stuff and a game sort of will emerge from this, right? And that was kind of the gist behind my talk, which was just establish a vision for your game um, and just then continuously iterate and try to set up your, your game systems such that they're really flexible and then you can just pull things out and, and put things in and just let the game kind of be, just become what it wants to be. Um, the problem with that is... Is, and I definitely agree that I think that's a lot harder to execute on a larger team. Um, if you've got if you've got 50 people working on a game and everybody can just put stuff in and take stuff out, um, then of course you got a big problem. So it, it, I don't think the talk was broadly applicable. I didn't ever advertise that it was, but I think some people took away the the wrong idea. All right, so we're gonna throw this bomb. We are going to let's see lifetime. So inside the bomb, we're gonna say lifetime. Slow the seconds. Uh, let's see, x plus equals. So with this bomb, what I wanna do is just have it move on its own. And then when it hits something, it'll just explode. So. Uh, and then if it if it lasts for I think one second or once it travels its maximum distance, then it'll it'll um, explode at the end of that as well. Okay, and what we'll do here is we'll just have a variable called exploding. It's false and exploding. And then here all we need is if it collides for now, I guess just with a tongue flower, then it's just exploding. Okay, so and just for a little debugging for now, since we don't have a graphic or a visual associated with this, we can just throw an echo in there. Uh, or we also have our marker thing. Let's do that. Spawn marker, X, Y, C, red, uh, radius of 20, and then I'll just last for like a half second. We'll need, we'll need to figure out what the actual effect of a bomb exploding is, but we'll get there. Hey, what's up, Jornker? Welcome to the stream. All right, so we're gonna throw this bomb. Uh, so bombs have an X speed and a Y speed. So we're just gonna say, um, we'll get the cursor position. So same thing we're doing here is mouse X, mouse Y. And again, none of this is gonna work with the joystick. So, uh, I just want to get it working well with one control scheme, and then if we like what the ability is doing, then we can refactor a bit and, and get it updated. I think it's important to not get too caught up in prematurely optimizing to make sure every system you make is, is perfect for every possible scenario until you're confident that that's the system that you want. All right, so we're gonna throw this bomb toward the mouse. Uh, then we'll just say, oh yeah, uh, let's see, ability, what do we do here? Ability begin cooldown. And Okay, and then the bomb needs to fly in the direction of, in that direction. So 
why don't we say, uh, let's see, speed distance, fly direction. Uh, is this. And what we can do is X speed and Y speed can just come out of this. So. that and when we have <clears throat> when we create the bomb we just give it a, a fly direction bomb needs to update its depth uh, let's see update world depth the bomb is a moving object, and so we want to make sure that um, as it moves around, it it has its its uh, depth sorting works properly. So one of the note here is this bomb's Z is zero, which means it's going to be sort of like feeling like it's inside the ground a little bit. Um, so we'll we'll adjust that. All right. So presumably, if I if I press E, then this will fling a bomb. Uh, in the direction of my cursor. Okay, so the bomb, for starters, feels like it's coming out of my, you know, between my legs. Not the greatest look. So it's also, oh, maybe maybe it moves at a good speed. Um, all right, so first thing, we want the bomb, of course, to have a higher Z. So. equals, let's go like 60. Get that 60 off the ground. <clears throat> Whoops, did not do that properly. It's because not being drawn properly. Sprite index, image index. X, Y minus Z. Scale, what is your scale? Point 0.1. So now we need, to, we need to actually draw this above and take that Z into account. Throwing pink eyes. Yeah, these do have kind of an eyeball like quality to them but you know this guy's an alien he's got no opinions uh, let's see with 30 high 30 so we want to get the width set properly let's go let's just double check and see how do these things okay so width height and then set mask okay so we were doing this circular mask thing um did I do a debug collision draw at some point? Hitbox draw. Yes. So if we're in debug mode, we make this hitbox draw. Debug mode in GameMaker is either you press F6 or you just click on this debug. It compiles you into debug mode, um, which then you can have certain aspects of your game work um, only in debug mode, which makes it extremely useful for or getting things tested in a way that you know it's not going to hit your players. Like I would never want my players to see all these hit boxes um, as much as they might want to. Okay, so if I throw my bomb nose, how, look how tiny that hit box is. So I want to get get that stitched up. Um. Let's go. So the bomb, its width is going to be, like, let's see, 9 to 81. So it's going to be like, like uh, 70. And its height will be the same.
And then I believe that, how does our shadow work? I think the shadow draw will automatically draw based on the width, so. Okay, so we can see how the hitbox definitely more closely maps to the size of this thing. So the way that we that we create this bomb is going to really affect the gameplay when we start actually using the bomb to fight enemies and stuff. Um, if this bomb moves really slowly, uh, then it'll it'll kind of it'll it'll make it a lot harder to use, right? So like the slower it moves, the harder it is to aim. If the, if the explosion radius is really big, then that can be really interesting. If it's timed instead of proximity-based, that could be something. Um, so one of the cool things about an ability like this is there's just a ton of uh, what I would call balance levers, just like little things that you can tweak to totally change uh, the feel of everything. Yeah, so you could add an arch effect. Um, the reason I wanted to do have them just kind of uh, fly in a straight line is I, I think it's kind of dissatisfying. Like if, if you were to throw a bomb, let's say like over here or whatever, but it's out of your range or something, um, then you would just see the bomb like fall down through the, the depths or whatever. Um, and I also want the bombs to hit... Uh, flowers and stuff like on like at, as uh have them be in the way so that you need to be thinking about the uh, terrain around you and the atoms around you if you can lob stuff over like that, that could be another ability potentially but, like if i could just throw things over these flowers then all of a sudden these flowers don't actually matter and they don't really affect what i'm trying to achieve in combat okay so that's step one is we are now Throwing bombs, um, as Talk Gibberish noted, the bombs do not blink, which is a huge problem. So, <clears throat> what do we want to do? Lifetime max is lifetime. Um, I think it'd be kind of cool if they blinked faster as they as they uh, got closer to detonating will be an easy way to do that I'm pretty sure there's some kind of goofy math stuff I can do for there but I'm kind of blanking on that for now so I'll just kind of do it the hard way or I guess the lazy way would say okay so all we're gonna do is um, let's see it's gonna start at image index zero and all we do here is we just say Every time we toggle its state, then we just cut the maximum cooldown in half, um, and then reset the cooldown. So, so it'll go. This might be too fast. So it'll go 0 0.2, 0 0.1, 0 0.05, blah 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 blah. Uh, and then we could probably just say, uh, maybe like. If blink max cool is less than like 0.0, or maybe like less than the frame rate, we'll just do that. This is 
probably not good to have it trying to blink faster than the frame rate can handle because, you know, that would be pointless. So let's try that. We'll kind of see, see how that feels. Blink cooldown, blink max cool. All right, so it's probably too, too fast. You don't really get the effect, right? So uh, either we could change the, the starting cooldown or we go ahead and just change like, you know, three quarters or something like that. We only have so much time to work with. So we have a second that this thing is alive. Yeah. All right, now there's one other thing we that has been missing in this game, which is sound effects. So there's this program called BFXR. And you can use it to make basically terrible 8-bit sounds, which is exactly what we want in this game. I'm going to see if I can... <laughs> I'm going to see if I can generate some sound effects here in a way that doesn't explode everyone's eardrums um is that is that super loud for you guys i don't really know all right that was no good yeah that was loud yeah one of the things i'm probably gonna have to do is generate some uh, sound effects outside of stream because making sound effects is basically just repeatedly exposing yourself to horrifying ear screeching noises. Yeah, I think every time I click on a sound, it changes the master volume. We have this, let's see, frequency. Um, I think we can do like a slide. You can get some vibrato in there. So really I just want something that kind of feels like a weird electronic sort of thing. I think this is kind of on the right track though. And we can even... Alright, we'll do this. This will work for now. I don't know if that master volume carries over or what. Uh, let's do this. Like a 0.25. Still just seems super loud. Okay, gonna put this into the folder and we'll see how it feels to have a beeping sound on that bomb flash. There is a reason that I haven't put any sounds in this game yet on stream and it's it's because of this. All right, so this is a wave, and we'll call this bomb boop. Um, and then last, all right, don't know how to make this be quiet. Everybody prepare yourselves. Okay, we're good.
But this is, we can do like a bomb sound. Oh God. Apparently every time I change the sound, it resets the volume to max. So don't, don't like that very much. <laughs> uh, let's see. Yeah, this is, I think this is a little bit more manageable ear-wise. I think this punch thing is kind of like uh, how hard it hits at the beginning. Do -do. Frequency slide. This is not a good sound. Tell you what, I'm going to just uh, not do sounds on stream because I don't want you guys to experience this. Just know that's where sounds come from. Um, maybe I'll do some off stream and then we'll, we'll work them in. All right, so we do need an explosion effect for this. So, so we can make this object So I think the easiest thing would be to give this explosion a... This explosion going to be... Maybe we don't need an object. Let's not do that. Create explosion. See if we can make an explosion that is literally just in a script. Explosion. Yes. Things exploded. All right, check this out. Explosion left is going to be explosion X minus explosion width 2.5. Explosion right, got that. height. So our grid ratio is the width or height to width of our grid. Explosion height, explosion width, and then we got this. Doo -doo -doo. Explosion top, explosion bottom. All right, collision ellipse list. Doesn't sound good when you read it out loud, but it's a good function. Explosion left, explosion top, explosion. When you do this function, make sure that it always goes top left corner to bottom right corner. Otherwise, I'm pretty confident it does not work. So right now this thing, we, all we can explode is tongue flowers. So, you know, it's a bit of a problem, but. Okay, so this is going to This is gonna populate our things exploded list with all the things that got exploded. 
Um, and then just so we can kind of get a sense of what is happening, I'm going to get them spawn markers in a, in a circle. Selector X, explosion width is 0.5, I. Instead of I, let's call this marker spawn direction. We'll make these orange. It'll last for half a second. Okay, so this is going to spawn markers in the area around so we can kind of see oh, the area that we're hitting. So, and what I will also do We're gonna destroy all the tongue flowers that we exploded. Okay, so these are our starting variables. Let's do this. Um, and then probably we want to shake the camera, right? Did we did we make that? Camera shake. I don't know, like eight. Great explosion. Okay. And oh bomb is going to, if exploding, create explosion. And that's gonna happen, X, Y, with, uh, I don't know, two, uh, 200, 100, 200. This might be, width might be the weird way to think about it. Let's do radius, actually. Because then we don't need to do times 0.5 on everything. Uh, 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 explosion. Uh, height. So we don't need to do 0.5 in there. Radius is easier to understand. It'll blow up things 100 pixels away, but it'll get crunched by the grid. So not perfectly 100 pixels, but that's the idea. So it's starting to feel like an explosion. Uh, let's try it on a flower. Okay. Let's see if we can get it in between. Can we shoot the gap? Okay, so those got exploded. What if we throw it up there? The explosion radius is small enough that if we hit a flower, chances are it's not really going to destroy much else. Since the explosion is from the center of the bomb, then... Which means it's going to be on the edge of the thing that you hit. So we can we can definitely beef up the radius on that. Double radius means quadruple the area. Uh, 
that's going to be a lot bigger. I like the idea of throwing a bomb and standing right next to it and somehow that being totally fine. Okay, so we have our placeholder bomb. Now we need to get now we need to get some special effects in here. So I'm gonna push this. Glad the chat is working today. I still haven't put up uh, the last stream because the chat wasn't working. I had to reboot the stream a couple of times. So now I have to edit that clip and stitch it all back together. No good. All right. So next up is some special effects. Um, so we have this player. And we have our particle manager here. Create system particle systems create type etm setup my particle systems okay what is it 11 30. okay it's time to make a particle manager like a real one all right so here's the the problem let me quickly put this into Trello. This has to happen before we make the bomb. Okay, uh, so the particle system. If you don't destroy your particle systems and particle types, um, then you will end up with memory leaks. And so with this explosion effect, I want to <clears throat> I want to have this spawn particles, but this is just a script. It's not an object. Um, and so I need to figure out how to easily destroy the particle systems that get created in here so that we don't end up with memory leaks. The best way to do that is to create a particle manager this is a persistent object the initializer is going to spawn one okay uh, so what we did in the player I'm gonna close all this stuff so we can start fresh In the player, we have this thing called uh, PTM setup. So all this particle stuff down here. PTM setup creates these lists in the player. My particle systems, my particle types. Uh, then we have PTM create system, PTM create type. So that adds these to uh, to the list. Then we initialize. The information about these things and then in the players cleanup event we do ptm cleanup so that's where we say destroy my particle systems destroy my particle types um, so this is all local and lives inside of the player object which is not useful if we want to spawn particles with a script or if we wanted to destroy the player uh, in such a way that that left lingering particles because if we destroy these particle systems the particles within those systems are also destroyed so uh, so essentially the idea here is to create a new system that it lives inside the particle manager and the particle manager will destroy uh, the cleanup of, of particles so let's let's try to conceive of that and get that done before the stream ends 
All right, particle manager, what do we need? We need particle systems. Okay, uh, let's see. Particle system types. So we're gonna map uh, particle types to particle systems. I can just do this. And particle system destroy timers. So we should be able to say, make this explosion, spawn these explosion particles, and then after two seconds, clean that up. Uh, and then we also say a particle system instances. Okay. So the goal here is I'm going to do a little bit of documentation here. Particle types. Um, particle types that are mapped to particle systems. So when the system, oops, when their parent system is destroyed, the types are destroyed. Timers for uh, cleaning up particle systems later. And then here we can attach particle systems to instances. So those instances, uh, or so those uh, systems can be cleaned up if the instances stop existing. Okay, so we have particle systems type, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so first thing we want to do in the player is just get rid of this cleanup thing. Don't need that. Because uh, that's now all going to be handled externally. And then we have PTM setup. Don't need that either. Because again, this lives somewhere else now. Charge PS, PTM create system. So let's look at this first. So we say with... particle manager we're going to create this we will uh, add to the list let's pop that up again so it's particle systems and which instance is this tied to if any So if we have no instance, or if we do have an instance parent, then we can say this map add particle system instances. Uh, we will map it to instance parent. Oh, wait, ps. I don't want to do this. Map the system to the instance, or the instance to the system. We're going to iterate over the systems, and then we can check for their instances. So I think that'll work. Uh, PS and instance parent. Phantasmic Galaxy, welcome to the stream. This cup of coffee's lasting me a long time. I feel pretty good about it, although it's cold. So People pay good money for cold brew, though, these days. Isn't that what cold brew is? You just uh, leave a cup of coffee out for two hours until it hits room temperature. All right, so we now we're saying we're going to create uh, 
particle system. This is gonna happen inside the particle manager. Note that if we don't have a particle manager, actually, I'm just gonna say, This is, a, this is a programmer problem, so you should be hit by an error here. And it should crash the game. Because you didn't hook it up properly. Alright. And then in the see, PTM create type. Uh, and this is going to be system parent. So a particle type has to have a system parent. All right, so instead of adding particle types, we're going to do this Particle system, uh, or particle types, okay. Let's actually call this particle system types since it is mapping types to systems. If we don't have this system parent, then we will add it. Okay, and then we will say uh, this system list is system types. Okay, so what we've done is we've mapped this particle type to a particle system. So now every particle system will have a list of types that's associated with it. Um, so that's going to allow us to, when we clean up the particle system, the types go with it. So in the player object, create system, instance parent is yourself. And the type is going to be associated with that. Okay, so we have the systems, we have the types, we have the instances. Now we just need to, in the step event, start managing these things. So we say step. I'm just going to grab this code here and hold on to it. that. Uh, Alright, particle system types. Alright, so we have, let's see, this PS. This particle system. First thing, if DS map exists, uh, particle system instances, then, then this particle system is associated with an instance. So we'll say, Should destroy all right so if we're supposed to destroy this particle system then here's where we will clean it up um, so here we are looking at the instance associated with the particle system if the instance is gone then we can destroy it next thing um, is Particle system destroy timers. All right, so here's the interesting part. Uh, 
if we have a destroy timer, then we'll actually ignore this instance thing. So, so for example, let's say the player has like a sparkly trail, like in the spin attack. If the player gets killed, we don't necessarily want that sparkly trail to just instantly disappear. It'd be cool if it lingered for a moment. So if we attach a timer to it, then the, the timer should actually override the fact that the player is gone. Um, so by default, we'll just destroy stuff if the instance goes away. And if, if we have a timer, then we'll use the timer instead. So minus equals slow mo seconds. Uh, for now, it's actually use seconds. So the other thing we can do with this particle manager is we can use it to make slow motion particles. So we can maybe maybe cover that this time, but. If not, we'll do it next time. Uh, all right, so particle system destroy timers. So if this is less than zero, once again, we should destroy it. And then last, we're gonna clean it up. And I would actually view this as, let's make a new group, particles, PTM, uh, destroy, yes, and we also want Kind of got a lot of a lot of moving parts here, but first thing, let's hit this uh, cleanup particle system. And this thing has to go through all these and get rid of everything. So Delete element, which is a script we made quite a while ago, convenient script. So that's taken care of. Uh, particle system types. So now we need to destroy all the particle types that are living in here. have this, then we will say these types equals, just grab this, uh, so this question mark accessor is how you reach into a DS map. I always use DS map exists though first because this would come back as undefined if we didn't check first. Type to destroy equals these types i. Part type destroy. Destroy that. Then we destroy the list. Actually, just for safety, did I properly? Okay, do some add list. Yes. So we destroy the list, and then we delete from the map. So this is one of the clunkier things you'll see about GameMaker is 
Ideally, I could just say, hey, just destroy this list and it would take care of the particles inside and all that stuff. Um, but GameMaker doesn't uh, inherently expose data types like that. So the particle types are literally just numbers and the lists are also numbers and the maps are also just numbers. And then you use those numbers to retrieve uh, information about those things, but um, but you can't just like destroy a list that's full of stuff and then expect that stuff to get to get taken care of on its own. At least not yet. All right, uh, let's see. DS map delete particle system destroy timers. If you run DS map delete on uh, something that isn't in a map, it's fine. It just won't do anything. And then we can also delete the instances part. All right, so this is cleaning up a specific part of the system. So back in our step event of particle manager, this is where it'll be. So if we're supposed to destroy it, then it'll get destroyed. And also notice that if we don't give something an instance, then it'll only be destroyed by the destroy timer. All right, uh, let's see. All right, so now in our, in our destroy PS script, this is where we can destroy a particle system. Um, Time to set. So by default, it'll just destroy it instantly. And if you set a time, then it'll it'll create the timer. Let's map a place. Uh, let's see. Particle system destroy timers. I guess we need to say which one we're gonna destroy. So we got the particle system, we got the time to set, and that'll work. And uh, if we don't have a time to set, then we'll just say, you know, let's just get rid of it. Okay. And to test this out, let's run some debug code on the particle manager. So I'm just gonna go to the draw GUI event and we're gonna say uh, GUI height, is that? Ah, okay. So I'm gonna draw these things onto the screen so we can actually see what's going on with these particle systems. Let's see, so we got all this stuff. A font set. Do we have font? We have font. Rig. So we're gonna iterate over these particle systems and I don't know, we'll go up 40 pixels each time. Draw text at like 10, uh, Y position, and this will just be draw the index of the particle system. And actually we could we could also draw 
put a timer so we can see what it's doing. String to draw. So this is one of those, it takes quite a bit of setup to get this kind of a particle manager running, uh, but once you've got it, it's very powerful, very useful, and then you can expand upon it too. All right, particle system destroy timers, string to draw plus equals, let's grab that. Okay, so this should allow us to see the timers associated with particle systems and just make sure the particles actually exist. Um, all right, so we have that. And we're creating the systems. I think, I think this is good. Let's look at our line. Oh, cool, okay. This is parent ID. All right, so now the warp pad um, is using the particle manager. Let's see how this works. And also just one final note, I did check the persistent box on the particle manager, which means it'll live between rooms. So I just spawned it at the beginning of the game and then it's just, it's just there the whole time. Okay, so down here in the bottom left, we see our numbered particle systems, which is just 0, 1, 2, 3. Uh, unfortunately, we can't really know anything more about them other than that's what their numbers are. Uh, so it should be the case that when I take one of these warp pads, uh, this instance will stop existing. All these will. And we should see these particle systems go away because they've been tied to instances. So let's do that okay so you see them get all cleared out and now the player has id 4 as their particle system and we are now just tracking that one so those particle systems have all been cleaned up they've been destroyed um, and now we are we are uh, making sure that we don't have any memory leaks and it's automatically handled without us having to ever say again whether to destroy particles So yeah, and then just to test out those timers, um, let's go ahead and say, let's do, let's go to the warp pads. All right, so warp pad, when it's, when the room ends, we can say PTM destroy PS. Ah, okay, so we already have this going on here. PTM destroy PS, and we'll have it destroy its system. So just like I said earlier, if we give this a time, so if we say like two seconds, then in theory, those particle systems should live for two seconds when we go to the next room, and then they'll be cleaned up, if this works as intended. And I need to get rid of these old ones. PTM clean up. All right, I think we're good. Let's try. Okay, part of the systems are all there. So we should see two second timers running on, I think one, two, and three when I change rooms and they should live for two seconds and then they should go away. And also you notice how, okay, so they'll go away. And I don't know if you noticed, but the, um, the particles themselves actually live between rooms. So uh, check this out. Let's, do we actually make a way to go back home? I don't think we did. All right, we'll reboot. 
Okay, watch this again. So particle manager will clean up these particles after two seconds because we said here, warp pad, room end, particle manager, destroy particle system, line particle system after two seconds. So I'm gonna step on the warp pad and watch these particles. They'll stop emitting from the warp pads because the warp pads go away, but the lines will still be present when I go into the next room. So. Oop, there they are, and then down here, they get cleaned up. So that timer system is what's going to allow us to spawn, when we throw these bombs, it's what's going to allow us to spawn uh, explosion particles that can then be automatically cleaned up without needing to make an object to handle that stuff, because now we just have a, a centralized place to do that. So I destroy this in the room end, and... Once again, this should make it so that the lines just uh, go away on their own because the instances stop existing. So there we go. So we have our particle manager. So I think uh, that, that'll do it for this stream. And let's go over to the Trello. Oh, let me commit this. So we create a particle manager system that'll automatically clean up particles if the timers expire or if their instances stop existing. Okay, so let's go over to the Trello board. All right, so we created a particle manager, so that's done. Um, so next up, next stream, we'll have to make the effects for throwing the bomb, and then after that we'll make an enemy that uh, you can actually throw the bomb at. And we'll probably also want some kind of effects for when the tongue flowers get destroyed and stuff like that, so we'll start to kind of develop the special effects of the game over time. Alright, and so we'll say episode 10 is the next episode. And, okay, cool. So I think that's everything for this week. Thank you guys very much for watching. I will make sure to have this up on YouTube uh, pretty soon. And we'll see you next time.